Hello, world history students. This is Mrs. Politsky, and I have your notes for Chapter 16, Section 2, The Spread of Protestantism. And so as we're heading out here, make sure you're writing down the things that you need. We're going to talk a little bit about Ulrich or Huldrych uh, Zwingli and Martin Luther. And Zwingli, for the most part, uh, and Luther, they stress some of the same ideas. They both believed in the idea of salvation by faith alone. Uh, Zwingli did not believe in purgatory, nor um, was he in favor of the sale of indulgences. But when we talk about the differences between Luther and Zwingli, um, one of the things that we need to remember is that Zwingli wanted to break away from Catholic traditions completely uh, and establish what he would call like an independent church-run state or a theocracy. Whereas Luther, on the other hand, really wasn't wanting to break away entirely from Catholic tradition. And hence, uh, they didn't get along. As a matter of fact, uh, at some point in time, there is going to be a series of wars that's going to happen in Switzerland. Uh, and Zwingli and some of his followers are going to be uh, apprehended in the battle. And unfortunately, Zwingli will be uh, basically turned over and executed in a really horrific kind of way. But he had a, a person who would come behind him uh, and be the one who probably did more to um, bring about Protestantism to parts of Switzerland. And that's a guy named John Calvin. Calvin and his ideas uh, were in common with Zwingli's church in that it was Protestant uh, in its notion. In other words, breaking away from the Catholic tradition, but everything was going to be based on this idea of a theocracy, that we're going to try to make a church-run state and try to make Switzerland into kind of a religious state for Protestants. Anyway, Calvin's church was successful uh, when Wingley's wasn't because of the fact that Luther opposed Wingley, whereas Calvin, not so much. Uh, Calvin had a larger power base from citizens who also embraced this idea of a strict uh, type of discipline as far as how people were going to live their faith. And to kind of get into that, uh, Calvin, for the most part, he believed that God was all powerful and all knowing. He also believe the idea that God uh, absolutely predetermined or determined the fate of all people. And this is the concept of predestination. So at the time that we're born, uh, God, for the most part, knows whether or not we're going to heaven or to hell. All right. There are two main characteristics of what he envisioned a city of God. Uh, he basically believed that all citizens had to attend church several times a week. There was also strict rules that govern people's behavior, such as no fighting, no swearing, no drinking, no gambling, no card playing, and no dancing for all you Footloose fans. Anyway, Calvinism was very popular in Scotland and also in the Netherlands. All right, moving on. We're going to talk a little bit about King Henry VIII uh, or basically the the man that nobody wants to marry here uh king henry VIII was um for the most part married to a woman named catherine of aragon but it was not necessarily a, a convenient marriage uh truth be it catherine of aragon was actually married to henry the eighth's older brother but when he died uh it, it was still seen that there was a need to keep an alliance between spain where uh, Catherine was from, and England. And hence, these two were married. Uh, Henry being a fairly younger guy, Catherine being a little bit older. Needless to say, uh, they had a child. Her name was Mary. And uh, all seemed well, but Catherine could not conceive additional children. And thus, Henry, uh, desperate for an heir, started looking for ways to get out of the marriage. Hence, we have this King's Matter. Uh, Henry VIII wanted an annulment for Catherine, uh, who could not bear him a son. And the Pope would not agree to annul this marriage. Matter of fact, neither would any of the bishops or archbishops 
in England at that time, particularly the Archbishop of Canterbury. Needless to say, uh, Henry was not too pleased. Uh, Catherine's nephew was Charles V, who was the emperor of the Holy Roman Empire. He had a lot of clout with the Pope, and he also had a lot of um, say as far as uh, how this matter was going to be handled. Needless to say, Henry was not too happy uh, with the, the outcome. And it's kind of unusual because at the time when Martin Luther was posting his 95 theses, uh, Henry VIII was seen as a kind of a, a great protector. He was actually given the title the Defender of the Faith uh, during that period of time. But how times change, especially when you don't get your way. And Henry, desperate to have this error, um, went ahead and dissolved the the Catholic Church in England and established a new church uh, under a document known as the Act of Supremacy. This Act of Supremacy gave Henry VIII the authority to establish uh, the Church of England. And at the head of the Church of England was Henry. So he could pretty much make any decisions that he wanted. Uh, one of the decisions was A, to divorce Catherine and to marry uh, his new sweetheart, Anne Boleyn. So I want to talk about the four rulers of England between 1509 and 1558. And we start obviously with Henry VIII, who uh, at one time was married to Catherine of Aragon. Uh, she would bear a child named Mary. Uh, along the way, he would divorce her. So I would say in the eyes of Catherine, they were probably never divorced. He would marry Anne Boleyn. And Anne Boleyn was very young. Uh, Henry probably would have been in his 40s, and Anne most likely in her late teens, maybe early 20s. Uh, pretty, a pretty big age difference between these two. I mean, he's almost like a father figure to Anne, which is kind of creepy. But anyway, uh, she bore him a child. Her name was Elizabeth, and Elizabeth would again go on to be queen at, at one point in time. Uh, but Anne was accused of basically adultery, and she was sentenced to death for treason. And she went to the Tower of London and was beheaded. Uh, he married then um, shortly thereafter a woman named Jane Seymour, and it's Jane that bears Henry, his heir, uh, a boy named Edward VI. But Edward was very frail. Uh, and later on, he would go on to die in his kind of mid-teens. And so that's going to open up a power struggle between uh, our older daughters here. So Mary I, who was sent away after the divorce and eventually lives in Scotland and comes back, is going to try to bring back Catholicism when she obtains the throne. and there's going to be war that's going to result and eventually Mary will die. And her half sister, uh, Elizabeth is going to take over and become queen. And she's going to rule for a significant period of time in England. Uh, she will never marry. And so upon her death, uh, there's going to be kind of a scramble to see who's going to become the new monarch. But in the time that she's in power, uh, she rules with a lot of sophistication. And actually this whole area of time becomes known as the Elizabethan era. And if you know anything about William Shakespeare and some of his writings, that all kind of comes during this period of time. All right, number 11, the Anabaptists. They were founded by a man named Jacob uh, Hutter and they were kind of radical. Uh, they seized control of the city of Munster, which is in Germany. And, um, I would say, I shouldn't say seize control, but they were in Munster. And eventually there were some people that obviously opposed them. But um, the Anabaptists were kind of a kind of an unusual uh, group of Protestants. Um, they they probably got in trouble because of, of one of their practices. And, and when these radicals who were upset with the Anabaptists took power, uh, they burned their books, they took their private property, but they were very upset with the fact that the, the Anabaptists were practicing polygamy. And as a result, uh, many of our Anabaptists were um, 
basically persecuted for their beliefs. What's interesting, uh, after some moving around and eventually um, over time leaving parts of Europe for the Americas, our Anabaptists kind of morphed into a group that we now refer to today as our Mennonites. Some people would even say there's a certain aspect of the Anabaptists that kind of falls along with even the Amish. But needless to say, this was another group of people that obviously um, were persecuted during their time in Europe. All right. Talking about religious orders, uh, the Society of Jesus, or the Jesuits, was founded by a guy named Ignatius of Le Leola. Uh, he was a wonderful Spaniard, and he chose to spread Catholicism through education opposed to force. What's really unusual about the Jesuits is when they um, were traveling around the world, even back in the, the 1600s and such, one of the things that they purposely tried to do was to learn the customs and traditions of the people that they were evangelizing to. So if that meant in, in Japan that they would learn the Japanese language, so be it. The Jesuits would go on to establish numerous uh, institutes of higher education. The one that's probably closest to us is Creighton University. Okay, Another Catholic reformer kind of of this era uh, back in 1562, was a woman named Teresa of Avila. Uh, she promoted religious reform of the Carmelite order, uh, which is one of the four major religious orders that was founded during the Middle Ages. Women that kind of took up uh, this order took a complete vow of poverty. And that might seem a little extreme, but it, it kind of puts them in a humble place as far as how they do their evangelizing. All right. As far as the Catholic Church was concerned, uh, this was a period of reform. And actually, we kind of talk about it as um, in the terms of the Catholic Reformation. And this began as a result of Pope Paul III um, making a call for an ecumenical council uh, that met in 1545 in the city of Trent. Trent is a town in northern uh, Italy, not very far from the French border. And it's at the Council of Trent that many of the reforms that were being called for by a lot of our Protestant reformers actually take place. So I want to talk about the six big ones. Uh, one was the idea that salvation could be achieved through faith and works. So it's not just faith alone, but you've got to do good things. You've got to be a good person. Um, it goes a little bit more into detail than that if you read through uh, kind of the readings that come out of the Council of Trent. But uh, needless to say, there was a clarification there that uh, might have helped some people understand where the church stood. They also believed that church tradition was equal to the Bible as a source of uh, truth. So there are some things that as Catholics that we practice that are not necessarily mentioned in the Bible. So like the idea of uh, dipping your fingers into the baptismal font to make the sign of the cross. Uh, there isn't much that is said about the sign of the cross or uh, even the idea of holy water within the font. But needless to say, it, it represents certain things that are tied into our, our spirituality. And that's thus the tradition. Along with that, Latin became the official language of the church. So when we talk about um, encyclicals, which are letters that are written by our popes, most of those are written in Latin, and then eventually they are um, basically uh, transposed and written into the language of the people. Needless to say, Latin is going to be the language for the mass up until the 1960s. Uh, the fourth item was the forbidding of the sale of indulgences. Now, a person can still earn an indulgence today, but they cannot buy it. And that's the big difference. Uh, our fifth item, clergy was ordered to obey uh, strict rules of behavior. And that would include this idea of celibacy when we talk about entering into the clergy, uh, vows of poverty as well. And each diocese was to establish some type of seminarian or seminary in school uh, to help evangelize and, and to help bring up more uh, clergy as the time would go on. So in number six, 
uh, the Inquisition. This was a court that was run by the Catholic Church in the country of Spain, whose function was to guard uh, Catholic and to protect Catholicism from Protestant ideas. Uh, the Inquisition was considered an abuse of power by some people because uh, they put some people on trial and tortured or even executed the guilty. Um, women and the poor were most often executed for alleged crimes of witchcraft. The Counter-Reformation or and Reformation affected politics and government and that it sarf often the harsh rule of colonial governments. Uh, it encouraged the development of independent states. So uh, as we kind of get out of this era of time, we're going to get into talking about something called nationalism, uh, which is the rise of, of countries. And we can thank this period of time to kind of putting an end to this whole idea of kingdoms and, and such. And then finally, it caused political power to be separated from the church. All right, number 19, the Reformation uh, worked to stop Protestantism by reforming Catholic doctrine and the practices of reclaiming uh, land that was now Protestant. And number 20, several areas of Europe remained Protestant despite the Catholic Reformation, uh, partly because of religious beliefs, but also to prevent money from going from their countries back to the Catholic Church. A lot of our um, princes that followed Luther in Germany, uh, this is kind of the main idea. They wanted to keep the money closer to home. All right. Thank you very much.